There are a number of ways to define loneliness, and probably the, the most basic and kind of clinical is the discrepancy between the needs or desires one has for connection and the connections that people have. And so if you feel that there's a gap between what you need and what you have, that's where that lonely, that sense of loneliness and isolation and disconnection enters in. The difference between loneliness and depression, besides the biochemical, at least in clinical depression, a very real biochemical component. Depression, very often, people do consciously withdraw and seek that out, and that, be that becomes something that we can see as a sign of depression. Whereas loneliness, people feel as if the world is withdrawing from them. And so then they fight against that and start to find the problem within themselves and then it becomes this kind of psychological loop that they can't get out of. But the ways that depression looms so large in our society, it tends to get the, the sort of marquee billing. Clinicians and researchers tend to look at depression and anything that seems attached to that, they just lump under that umbrella. And so they don't necessarily look at loneliness as its own phenomenon. And it is under research. What really, what is it? What is, what is it at its core? And so it means that we don't really have a clear enough sense of loneliness other than if we think of it as a, as a symptom. And as we're seeing now more and more all the time, we're beyond the, the, the time of really needing to take it on its own terms. So where does today's loneliness stem from in the age of hyperconnectivity with social media? So the good of the social media is its possibilities in encountering people at a great distance. We're not limited by geography or physical contingencies. And so we can find that there are people who are really, really into Swedish horror movies and I thought I was the only one, and I live in rural North Dakota. And so then you can join these kinds of groups and interact with people at a great distance. So that's, that's the benefit. The problem with it is that social media, by its very nature, is all surfaces. And so rather than a depth of, co of conversation or a depth of connection, we have a proliferation of very shallow ones which is a lot like eating a lot of junk food, that it feels like you're eating a lot, and then an hour later, because it's empty calories, you're starving. It's because what we're taking in in social media, by and large, isn't satisfying, fulfilling, intimate, but it gives the illusion of having made those connections. And so we think, okay, we're sated, we sit back, and then realize I haven't had a real conversation with anyone. I haven't acted or interacted in real time. I haven't read body language. I haven't taken that next step because it's all ephemeral, moving very quickly, none of it pinned in time. And not to mention also what has become pretty, I think, indisputably true is that it also is becoming a way to kind of cudgel people, like single people out, it becomes a tool for, for bullying. All the, again, all the sort of surface behaviors can, can get weaponized that way, which makes everybody feel all the worse. And also, you know, and I guess maybe finally, what we project onto social media is often a curated version of ourselves. It's not life in real time. It's I've chosen this and I know that I'm presenting this to the world because I want them to have a, a view of me. And so then people only see the best of other people and feel the reality of their life, which is partly good and partly sad and partly all the messy things that they are, but they see everybody else's perfect life. And so that discrepancy opens up, that gap opens up and it feels bad. But also I think part of it is we become susceptible to our own surface, that we look at the curation of our life. And maybe this isn't true for everybody, but I think that there's a kind of deep unsettling of it, that we look at the, the representation of our life that we make to others and realize it's only a mask. This is what I wish it were, but I live the messiness of it. And the feeling, being able to kind of craft and show people the best and knowing it's hollow makes you feel alienated from your own life.
And so all of that works together to make people feel lonely. And then ironically, the way social media works is that we then try to make up for that by, you know, doubling down and, and doing more, connecting more, joining more sort of platforms and trying to spread out that way. But again, it's just more and more of the same, you know, very thin layer of connection. So exquisite loneliness is a kind of self-awareness of one's loneliness while one's living it. This means that you can become aware of not only the need that you feel for connecting to other people, but what that tells you about who you are. If I need something, then I start to be aware of the lack. And then I have the option of saying, well, what is it that I, I, I lack? What is it that I assume I need in my life? What are the kinds of relationships? Why or how do I feel different from other people? And wanting to understand if I feel different or if I feel lonely, not only what do I need, but what do I think other people need? And what I think that does is create a possibility of empathy and caring and understanding of other people. And that, I think that's where the hope is. It isn't the, that there's a solution and I'll figure it out because then it means why haven't you figured it out yet? No, it means, look, this is, this is, this is the struggle. And that's the beauty of it. Um, and that's why when we do make connections, why they're so meaningful to us and why they're worth pursuing. Um, and why if it takes time or if in this period of time we don't feel it, it's not our fault.